afternoon, whatever time you are watching, I welcome you to our service, our Sunday service. Thank God for life that God has granted to us. Let us pray before we start. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you once again and trusting ourselves into your care. Thankful of all of the goodness and of your mercy we have enjoyed. We commit now this hour into your care and all that will be listening in by design or by your own direction. Bless their hearts with understanding, O oh God. And use this to touch as many hearts that you have planned. I commit myself into your care, O oh God, and for your leading Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Now, welcome again to today's service. As usual, I want you to listen carefully. Talk to somebody. Tell somebody to join us if you can so that they can be part of this. You are helping to do the work of the evangelist. And I want you to listen carefully, understand, try to understand and respond with whatever comment, okay? And before I go on, I'd like to say a happy Father's Day to all of you. Fathers, the Lord had honored you and blessed you. May he continue to bless your fruit with honor, with integrity, may they grow up to become children that we can be proud of. Now let's go into the teaching now. For some weeks, we've been teaching on the end times, Christ, uh, Christian eschatology. We've been talking about end time events. It's actually a study we've been trying to do. Now, a lot of what we're talking about had already become history, prophecies that are already fulfilled. So I know it sounds boring sometimes, confusing to a lot of people, especially to young Christians who in their lives, lifetime of being Christians, especially our children, have not had this series of teachings. So they may be a little bit even confused. Good. What I want you to do, if I have succeeded in doing that, is to stir up your curiosity. Ask your pastors, ask your friends, ask your parents questions concerning what we have discussed. And thankfully, you can, by technology, go back, depending on whatever means, YouTube, okay, Facebook, uh, on our website, www.isjames.org. You can always go back to study these um, teachings that we have done. The, the aim is to be able to give you time to go through and go check scripture so that you can be well acquainted. Now, let's go straight. Today, we were attempting to wrap up. Now, we started with um, the questions that the disciples of Jesus Christ asked at the Mount of Olives in Matthew chapter 24. The first three verses, this was the disciples asking Jesus. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came, to, came up to show him the, the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? As shortly I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, we've already covered the fact that there were three questions that were asked in that very third verse alone. Number one, when will all these things be? When will these things that he talked about, the destruction of the temple, and of the city, when will it be? Jesus Christ's simple answer, when you see Jerusalem being besieged by an enemy army. At the time, it was under the, that place was under the, Romans, uh, the, the, the Roman rulership, the Roman empire. The direct answer, you have to go to Luke chapter 21, verse 20 to 24, to be able to get the answer 
to that question. Second question, the sign, what will be the sign of your coming? Notice, we've already covered all of this again. I'm just making a quick recap. The disciples asked about a sign, not signs. But Jesus Christ started by giving them signs leading to the sign. Okay? And the sign Jesus Christ gave them was the burden. When the fig tree begins to blossom, okay, you can get that directly in Luke chapter 21, verse 29. Okay, and Matthew 24, 32 to 34 also. When the, when the fig tree, fig tree always symbolic of Israel, natural Israel, begin to blossom, begin to flex its muscle, nationalism, begins to obtain status, demand that they have now be given their own country. And then it begins to bubble, it begins to board, that tree begins to board. That generation that will see the Israel come into nationhood as he did in 1948, okay? That generation, and we understood that a generation in our last teachings, generation in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 and 16, a, genes a, a generation is about 100 years, okay? And Israel obtained their nationhood in 1948. That generation that will notice the fig tree, Israel obtaining nationhood, shall not pass when all of these things come to, come up, come to pass. Then we concluded then that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the end of the age, we are almost about it because we are about 20-something years thereabout away from about 100 years since Israel came, became a nation. Okay. Now the third question finally is the side we're going to deal with. Remember the first question, the second question, and then the third question, the end of the age. What will be the sign of the end of the age? of the age. Most of the signs Jesus Christ gave leading to the sign, the, the, the fig tree blossoming, are the same similar signs that are going to continue until the end of the age. Okay, but the particular one thing that Jesus Christ mentioned as a sign of the end of the age is recorded in Luke, uh, Matthew 24, um, verse 15 especially. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel stand in the place, in the temple, then you know, you know ultimately that begins the countdown to the round of the age. So that took us then, Jesus Christ's reference to Daniel took us to the book of Daniel. It was there that we now looked at the second chapter of Daniel, the book of Daniel, 7th, 8th, especially to the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, where we showed you the great image in chapter 2 of Daniel. Daniel's, you know, great image that he saw in Nebuchadnezzar's forgotten dream. And then we came to chapter 9, that, I mean, amazing, outstanding uh, vision that he saw, where God unveiled to Daniel the whole calendar of heaven and earth, as it were. Okay, the timeline. From the beginning of the building of the walls and the cities of Jerusalem until when Messiah comes, when he is cut off, A.D. 3, 3, 33, and the church is the beginning of the church is the Gentiles, time of the Gentiles, ending up with the rapture, and then starts up the last one week of Daniel, okay, with the tribulation leading to the second coming and all the rest that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be focusing on that last one week, the end of the age. Okay, so let's now go to talking about the main, main um, outlines, the main issues and the personalities during the end of the age when the last one week of Daniel also known as the starting of the tribulation, the great tribulation starts until when everything is wrapped up, okay? Now, we have said in our past teachings that the time of the Gentiles, also known as the church age, okay, the age of the church, has lasted since Christ's crucifixion on the cross of Calvary until it will end with the rapture. Now, we said that all of the signs have been concluded had come to pass. And so no one that is born of the blood of, blood of Jesus Christ by grace 
and I've come to receive the presence of the Holy Spirit that is Bible knowledge and Bible based, not sentimental churchians, no Christians that are Bible based, nobody will be surprised if as I speak, the rapture takes place. And last, in the just last week alone, I have taken a time to go through a, a, an imagination journey, trying to paint a picture of the chaos that will, will resume. Cars flying out, aeroplanes falling, and the uh, hospital being over flooded, and suddenly, you know, police people and army and leaders of government vanishing and the graves opening, all kind of things. The, the rapture probably will be the greater, one of the greatest things that will shake this world with hundreds, millions of people vanishing without any of the ones left behind seeing physically, knowing what is happening, except those who will not be ready. That chaotic event to the people that will be left behind, but a joyous homecoming for those of us who will, who, who will be seeing the Lord Jesus Christ being caught up, changed suddenly to, to meet him in the air. That, but the rapture is, is going to start off a chain reaction of events that are going to start, that is going to start off the beginning of the end of the age. The third and final question, the disciples asked Jesus Christ. And I also have touched on the fact that probably following the chaos that will be started off by the rapture, the first major thing that you're going to notice is a summoning of the world, of the whole world together under probably the auspices of the United Nations. Maybe the formation of a one world government with a lot of the leaders and high government officials vanishing, Christians that had vanished during the rapture. There will be chaos, systems collapsing and all of the things that we see today as is probably will be rearranged. And of course, one of the Major things will be the, in, the, in that chaos, the United Nations will call the nations together. They will sit down together. They will try to restore order. And they try to pro, uh, pro, provide some kind of calming effect and maintain peace. And in that process, a world leader will emerge. He is going to sue for peace. He is going to calm everybody down. The world will rally round about him. He is not going to be immediately called the Antichrist. It is his activities and lifestyles and how he is going to lead the whole world against God that will eventually unveil, show to the world that this probably was the Antichrist. Remember, the church has been taken away. And Jesus Christ said, the Bible clearly said, that one of the reasons that the Antichrist possibly may be alive as I speak depending on how close we are to that event called the rapture. And with the rapture and the Holy Spirit, this body of Christ, the church and the Holy Spirit, the restraining forces are according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 talks about he who restrains will still restrain until he be taken out. The Holy Spirit and the church is the restraining factor. Be taken out of the way, then shall that you know, son of perdition, the Antichrist will be revealed. Now, when he comes on the scene, he will come on the scene as the deliverer, as a great leader, exceptional, exceptionally bold, smooth talking. He will command the respect of the world, talking about peace. The Bible said he will come peaceably. According to Daniel, he is going to be a fierce looking man, a very cunning deceptive man that will lead the whole world against God. Both Daniel and uh, the book of Revelation describes this Antichrist that will emerge as one of the principal actors during the Great Tribulation, following the rapture immediately, as a beast. And I think at this point, let us go to read uh, Revelation chapter 13. The first verse introduces the rise of the Antichrist. Revelation 13.1. And the Bible says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea. I saw a great beast. I saw a beast rising up out of the water, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his ten on his horns, ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. He rises from the chaotic trouble system following the rapture, and he gathers everybody's um, 
attention, draws everybody's loyalty, and then soon he begins to lead the people away. Is he is a beast? That's the point we are making. He's a monster, an anti Christ, anti God. Okay, he rises from the sea. The sea in the Bible is always symbolic of multitudes of people. Daniel, Revelation chapter 17, verse 15 also talked about that. Uh, the, the, the waters which you saw are peoples, multitude, nations, and tongues. Okay? Uh, so a sea of humanity, that's how we always call it. So it's a metaphor for. But we are told that he's going to rise from the old Roman Empire. At the time of his rising, that area would have been realigned, nations and the kingdoms that will exist at the time. And that is why many people in our past study will also refer to it that the present Euro the European Union may just be the mother, the format that may be rearranged. Remember, the realigning of that European Union has already started with Britain already pulling out. The Bible says he will come from one of the ten regions, but when he comes up, it, by his uprising, he will overthrow three of those kingdoms or nations. And the rest of the other nations will now give their power to him. But that is only the human aspect of it. The very power that is empowering this, this beast, this human being, that will capture the energies of the whole world and the whole world will follow him, the Antichrist, he draws his power from Satan himself. That much is told us in Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. The description fits everything. Okay, And then the latter part of that verse said, The dragon gave him his power. The dragon, remember what a dragon is, Satan, gave him his power, his throne, his authority. So this Antichrist is a human being, but everything about him, his power, his authority, his throne is backed up by hell. I'm not talking about his demon possessed. This is Satan in all of his power, empowering one human being. So you can see how, 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 how fierce, how complicated a military man, very cunning, very deceptive, all of the qualities of Satan is manifest in this one being. Okay, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, I can read that for you. The com he is the coming of the lawless one. He is called the lawless one according to the walking of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Okay, Matthew 24, 24, from the lips of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, if it were possible, the, the signs and lying wonders, this Antichrist will walk, will be such that it will deceive even the very elect, those whom God have already chosen to be with him. That is how confusing he will be. Now, in, he is going to speak soon after his emergence, he is going to speak pompous things, blasphemous things. Blasphemy is just verbal assault, insult against God. He is going to lead the whole world against God. Remember, everyone that is godly and as part of the church has been taken away. So what is left in humanity is the, the worst of human beings that are left behind, that is leading. They will blame all of the chaos and everything on God, on the followers who have now vanished, and they are, he is going to inspire and stir up every remaining human being against God, as it were. So things are going to be very tough for anybody that's going to be left behind. He's going to speak pompous things against God, and then he will move on, okay, to make war. The Bible said he will try to wear out and wear out the saints. He will make war with the saints, and he will, God will allow him to even prevail against the saints. Now, that is a group of people that will still be left behind that knows God, especially physical Israel. Daniel 7, 25 says that. Revelation 13, verse 7 also says that. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, one of the things that he will seek to do when he emerge, will be, he will seek to change the laws and the times and the seasons as we have them right now. He will seek to install his own system, cancel what has been there before. He, remember, he's trying to undo everything that is associated with God. Okay? And then... He, the Bible said he is going to oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God. 
2 Thessalonians 3, I mean, chapter 2, verse 4. He's going to exalt himself against all that is called God or is worshipped. And at a particular time, in the middle of the last one week in the period of Revelation, he will go and even sit in the temple of God uh, and showing himself to be God in the newly rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. He will eventually, Daniel chapter 8, verse 11, and Daniel 9, 27, we have already covered all that. Eventually, he will, in that newly built temple, some people believe, he will go and stop the sacrifices that will be going on. And then he will now sort of set up the abomination of desolation that Jesus Christ prophesied about. He will now set it up, and that is going to now open the eyes of the Jewish people, and they will stop backing him. Every godly person, especially, that will now stop backing him, that's when his full color, nature, as an anti Christ is going to be unveiled, and then the world will now, and then, of course, chaos will break loose. He will now go into not, co not just speaking to people and coercing them, he will now force people. That is the time when marks and symbols will now be given, or you die, or kind of something like that is going to happen. So the, that is the Antichrist. He is further called Daniel's little horn. There are various names in which he's given, the lawless one or the wicked one, this one is so weak, is the emergence, the personality of wickedness. Remember Jesus Christ earlier saying, because iniquity will abound, this guy is going to promote lawlessness. That is what is going to lead to apostasy, and that's why he's called a man of sin, son of perdition. These are all the different names by which the Bible has referred to him. Now, he will continue and prosper until the time appointed at the time of the revelation. And he, of course, he is going to be defeated at the second coming of Jesus Christ with his saints. And he's going to be destroyed in the battle of Armageddon. Okay? Uh, as is prophesied, Revelation chapter 19. Okay? So the Antichrist is going to be the chief, one of the chief actors. And there's another actor that is going to support him. Immediately following the emergence of the Antichrist will be another beast called, in, in religious terms, the false prophet. Okay, In that same Revelation chapter 13, but we are going to go down to verse 11, you will see the emergence of the second beast. And the Antichrist rose up from the sea. The second beast, verse 11, says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. The same thing, but just a little bit of different, a little bit different. He, he comes following him. Now listen to this description. He had two horns like a lamb, like, keyword, like, two times you will see it. Like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He is trying to, everything about the Antichrist and the false prophet is a mimicking of what Christ has been. Okay? If you don't accept the reality of who Christ is, you will accept the fake. That's the point. Okay, so they are, trying to, they are trying to mimic God and Christianity. This false prophet is the official religious spokesperson of the Antichrist and the devil. They are go he, is, he, he is going to be the spokesman for the one world religion, as it were. The Buddhists, the Muslims, the, the, the traditional Christians, the Greek Orthodox, and or whatever you call them, every group of people that see them, all world religion will come together and they will affirm the superiority and the leadership of the Antichrist that will emerge. And then one spokesman, it could be the papal leaders of the Catholic Church, I don't know. But there is going to be a religious representative, as it were, the official spokesman. When all of existing religious systems come to support the Antichrist, who are you to say that he is not from God? For those, I'm asking those of you who will be left behind. So he, 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 the official spokesman will be the one speaking on behalf of all of the religious systems that, are, that is now prophesying that this man, the Antichrist, was really the, is really a man from God, that people should support him. And of course, Satan, just like he supports the Antichrist, is now going to support the false prophet. They form the, what we call the demonic trinity, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And the false prophet is going to be given so much power, all of the power of Satan, 
And actually, he is going to be given the power and the lying wonders. In fact, he is going to speak to humanity that then was then existing to make an image in honor of the Antichrist. Probably one of the things that will be placed as or being referred to as the, the image of abomination or desolation that will be man. And this false prophet will have so much power. He will call down fire from heaven. He will cause that image that men have made, he will cause it to come alive. And that image itself will be speak. You will watch it. You will see it. If you don't join me in going in the rapture, you will be alive to see all of these things. But born again, spirit-filled Christian, saved by the grace, washed in his blood, are not worried about this thing because we would have gone. We would have gone, probably watching from heaven, all of these things. And some of our, God forbid, refused, rebellious relations probably may be going through all of it, but it is not going to be a portion. I pray it is never going to be a portion in Jesus' name. And this is the reason we pray that none of your people, this is the reason we, we, we pray and I declare that none from your family will ever have to go through this in Jesus' name. Now, during this period, all the world will be in chaos. Now, remember, this is the period where God is now pouring out his wrath on humanity that has rebelled against him, killed his people, destroyed and blasphemed him. This is the time when God is pouring out his wrath upon humanity. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall it ever be. Such a time when men and human beings, men will be looking for death, begging death. Please come and kill us. And death said, I'm busy. I have no time for you. Think about human beings looking for death and there will be no death. Such will be the situation of great people. Again, I declare it is not your portion. You will not be there for it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, once again, this false prophet, together with the Antichrist and Satan, forms the demonic trinity. And all of what they will be doing will be appearing. All so Look, religious people, will, they are already today walking. Most of what you call miracles and signs in today's churches, I'm not talking about tomorrow or future, now, most of them are. Remember the Bible said, John the Apostle, that eventually wrote the book of Revelation, said the spirit of Antichrist is already right now walking. It is the man that will be revealed later, but the spirit that will come upon him is already walking. So signs and wonders that we'll, we will see at that time is already walking today and three times in Matthew chapter 24 alone, Jesus Christ warned, be careful, do not be deceived. One of the things that the false prophets will do is that he will promote Satan worship. Already, it is already started. There is a place, you see probably on the social media, a church of Satan already started in South Africa and in many of the Western worlds. Okay? He will promote Satan worship. He will force people to worship that image that men have made, that he has given power to wake up and speak and talk. Again, I declare you will not be part of it in Jesus' name. But he is going to perform so much wonder that is going to amaze people. Okay? The beast is going to back him up. Okay? And at, at, such, that, at such a time, he is going to now, that false prophet is going to now demand. He it is not even the Antichrist, that men worship the Antichrist or the image of the beast or the Antichrist or the image of Satan that he has made or and take the mark of the Antichrist either upon their right arm okay, or on their forehead. Okay? And the Bible said without which nobody will be able to do something. They are going to be able to enforce things like that. Now, what is this mark? The Bible simply says that it is the mark of a name, the name of the beast, the number of his name. Uh, in, in, in some numerology, especially in the Hebrew form, numbers are not just A, B, C, D, but numbers are attached to them. It is called a gematria. So when that person emerges, the name, the numbers total together of his name will amount to 666. Now, I don't know whether that will be a visible sign, a computer. It's not going to be a computer. I don't know. But 
visible or visible, one thing, let me tell you very clearly, then that mark will be is, it is a mark that will clearly define the chosen side. That mark will mean you have clearly taken sides, either with God or against the Antichrist. And you're going to pay some penalty. Okay, either a debt or other things will happen. But that is what is going to happen. Nobody's going to force you into it. So don't worry too much about what form, what shapes, that 666. Don't worry. Let, let unbelievers worry themselves about it. We have other things to worry. Okay, now those are the key um, uh, the, the, the figures that will be active during the Great Tribulation. The beast, Satan. And the first beast that comes out of the sea, the Antichrist. And then his third uh, associate, the beast that the second beast that comes out of the earth, Je Revelation 13, uh, 11, that we have talked about, the false prophet. Okay? Satan the beast, him, Satan himself, the first beast, Antichrist, the second beast. They are all beasts, and they are all walking, not by their own power, but Satan giving them the full backing of his power. They are going to be doing a lot of things that are going to be destructive. At that time was when, is when God is going to pour down his wrath upon them and the, those who will be alive on earth. This great tribulation in, in period is going to, according to Daniel, is going to last for about seven years. We've already touched on that Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, I believe, talked about that period. Okay, But in the middle of that one week, seven year period, the peace that the Antichrist shaped and formed when he showed up is going to be broken and then things will be um, escalated. Op oppression and punishment is going to come so much. Um, time of Jacob's trouble. That is how Jeremiah described it. Jeremiah 37. Daniel 20, 12, 1 says, a, a time of trouble like never was. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about a dangerous period. Okay? Like I said, when men will look for death, Revelation 6, 15 to 17, and you will not see death. Isaiah called it the day of the Lord's vengeance. You see all kind of things, people kidnapping, raping, and destroying men's life, and as it where God has been silent, Oh, wait for it. His day of vengeance is coming when he's going to take vengeance on every wicked stuff. Human beings stared up as Satan has done against God and against other people. That is coming. Isaiah 34, 18, uh, verse 8 says that. Okay. The day of the Lord. The New Testament basically described the period of the uh, tri uh, uh, tribulation as the day of the Lord. As against the day of Christ. Whenever you see in the New Testament the word the day of Christ being mentioned is referring to the day of the rapture. Okay, Christ coming to take his own people. When it's the day of the Lord, is referring to the period of revelation. Okay, the uh, Revelation chapter 6 verse 17 also refers to the time of the great tribulation as the day, the great day of his wrath. The great day of his wrath. Notice God's vengeance, his wrath, trouble like never before. This is not a time when people should be looking forward to. Once again, Lord, I pray everyone hearing the sound of my voice. Oh God, you will touch their hearts and Lord, change them. I pray for everyone listening to me. I pray for our children that they will hear and that you pull them to yourself. Change them. We break the power of rebellion and Lord, let the power of the cross work in their life, transforming, making them ready for your rapture in Jesus' name. But following the end of the tribulation period, Christ is going to come back again. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he comes in the cloud, and all eyes shall see him. Acts 1, 11, we have been told, this same Jesus that you saw taken away from you will come in the same form. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 to 16. Revelation 19, 11 to 16 Beautiful picture of the master himself, Jesus Christ, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, riding a white horse. And you and me, who had earlier been raptured, also riding our own white horses with gown, following the armies of heaven. When he comes, eventually, to destroy the Antichrist and his hordes. 
So he is coming eventually. That is when he comes back. Now, the rapture when we are caught up is different from when he comes back. The rapture begins the tri great tribulation. The second coming ends. Come, happens at the end of the great tribulation. And when he comes, he comes with. In the rapture, he comes for his saints. During the second coming, he comes with. You and I are going to come with him. Seven years we've been off the earth, and we're going to come back once again. His feet is going to step on Mount Olive. That's where we're going to drop. Hallelujah. I'm looking, so looking forward to that. I've been there before on Mount of Olives, and every time you, you have a chance to visit Israel, that was where he was taken up. And that's where his feet, Zechariah, told us about that. Zechariah told us about that. His feet is going to stand and he's going to split. They are going to be following an earthquake, I guess, that is going to happen at that very particular time. Okay? And then Jude 14 also talks about the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints after the conclusion of the celebration of the marriage supper between the bridegroom and the bride. I want to say something about also the millennium. The 1,000 one years reign that is going to follow after the second coming. After we come back with Christ and after Satan has been bound and thrown into the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 20. Then we will begin a season and a time. Physical and literal um, period of 1,000 dis years dispensation that you and I, again, my friend, glorified with Christ. This is not spiritual anymore. Physically living, okay, where Jerusalem become the center of the world and believing nation that will be alive at a time and others that went through the, the, the period of revelation are going to be allowed. There are some sinners that probably will be alive also at that time. Because when Satan eventually is loosed again, he will have a people to convince, to lead against God one more last time again before he's finally annihilated completely. So during that period of time, after following the second coming, there will be a thousand years reign. Maybe I'll just quickly read, uh, if you can have it, uh, Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit. And a great chain in his hand. Guess who that chain is for? He laid hold of the dragon, Satan. That serpent of old who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. In those first seven, ten years. Verse, let's go down. Let's go down. You will see, notice that thousand years repeated again and again about six, seven times. Verse 4 says, I saw thrones and they that sat on, the, on, 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 on them. Judgment was then committed to them. Then I saw souls of men that were beheaded now being raised up. And those who have not received the mark of the beast, we're going to come to read that place again. Last part of verse 4 says, and they lived and reigned with Christ for again a thousand years. Verse 5 again. You will probably see that verse again. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And so you will see that. Uh, you, you can read down to verse 7 later on, but we, because of time, we are going to go. So you get the picture. A thousand year period. Now, I know there are some people who said, well, that's not a literal 1,000 years. Well, whatever it is. I am with Christ. That's what matters. So whether it is physical or spiritual, I am with him. And don't you want to be with him? Is this the time you really want to go into that argument whether it's spiritual or literal? I don't care what it is, provided I am with him. And you are going to be with him also in Jesus' name. Now, 1,000 years of creation. Sometimes it is easy to believe it is, literal, it is spiritual. But I believe it's going to be literal because there are several scriptures that doesn't make sense the moment you say it's spiritual. For instance, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Remember that big image we saw. The stone that is caught without hand will hit that image. And then the stone itself, after destroying that image, will come to become a big mountain and fill all the earth. What does that mean? Literal or spiritual? Maybe it is spiritual. I don't know. Chapter 7 of Daniel also. Okay, the thrones will be exist and then will be given over. The throne and control of the earth will be given to the uh, sons of men, the children, those who follow the ancient of days. Isaiah chapter 11 is very, very instructive. I, I wish I can read it for you. Isaiah 11 from verse number 6. It says, 
The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a child shall lead them. The cow and the bear deer shall graze with the young ones. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child shall play with the, by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. I don't know why he should, but uh, it doesn't matter. Then they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth, now listen to this, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, since the world began to this time, has that scripture been literally fulfilled? Not yet, but it's going to come to pass. So scriptures like this, scriptures like this tell us somehow that there is going to be a period of time. Other people will say, well, that will be when the new earth and the new heaven come to pass. Well, in that case, you, all you need to do is to read further other scriptures like Isaiah 65, where the Bible says a child will die probably 100 years old. Okay, and, and, and you will plant, and I don't know whether anybody will also die again during the new world and the new heavens. Death and tears, remember, are passed away in that world. So it, it goes to point out that uh, the, the truth of that teaching of a literal period of 1,000 years that will follow f after the second coming, okay, at the end of the tr great tribulation, and you and me are going to be part of it. Many, uh, one of the many reasons why that is going to take place, I, I, I believe, is it is time to restore the earth back to its original position, original form, before the fall of man. Remember, when Adam and Eve were living innocently in that garden, there were trees everywhere blossoming, and they were told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God is going to restore everything back. And for a thousand years, God is going to give that opportunity. Instead of blaming Adam and Eve, your time is coming. Aren't you looking forward to a time like that? Hallelujah. We're looking forward to a time like that. A time that is when also in the book, Matthew, in the book of Matthew, you know, there's a proverb, there's a, a scripture we always refer to. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 46, when God is going to separate the goats from the sheep. And tell the goat, depart from me. And, and we have always misinterpreted most of the things Jesus Christ taught in that section of the Bible. is always misinterpreted. And people say, oh, well, there are going to be wicked people who do not take care of people. When I was in the prison, you didn't. No, 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 no. Look at it again. Verse 31, especially Matthew 21. It's talking about nations. This, is, this scripture is going to be literally fulfilled only during the millennial. When it comes back nations and groups of languages of peoples that will not follow the Antichrist at the time of the Great Tribulation that will assist, be friendly, and in support of the godly remnant that will re remain. Nation groups will be allowed to exist. Okay? It, 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 the way they relate to God's people at the time, it will be the will be the sheep nations and the ones who are hostile for taking sides with the Antichrist will be the good nations. So scriptures like that will be fulfilled. The earth will be at peace because remember, during the time of the 1,000 years millennial reign, Satan is bound and thrown into the bottomless So that is going to be a picture of what will take place 1,000 years. At the end of that 1,000 years, the Bible said, Satan is going to be released again one more time. God, I don't understand sometimes how far he can go in his mercy and compassion. Because that one last time when Satan is released again, he is going to go back and do only the only thing he knows how to do. Deceive, confuse people and lead them against God. And even after that 1,000 years, believe me, there will be some people who will still be taking side with Satan against God. And that was that be time when God now said, enough is enough with the breath of his, that comes out of his mouth, and the description of that is in back in Zechariah chapter 14. If you go back there, you will see, while they are standing, every part of their bodies will just melt, and they will fall. Okay? It, it, it's a perfect description of what will happen when the, when the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb is exploded. Peter already told us, okay, this earth is going to be renovated as with fire. Everything will melt. 
Again, I declare this is not your portion in the name of Jesus Christ. You are going before all of these things happen to wicked people, but you are not going to be part of it. None of your family will be part of it in Jesus' name. This is the reason why we do what we do. We do not joke with our children. We do not keep silent when people are doing bad. We let them hate us. We are not seeking to be popular, but we will do what God wants us to do. We will beg, we will plead, we will pray, we will coerce. Like Jude will say, we will even pull, try whatever we can. Because nobody ought to go through that. Remember, hell was not made for human beings. It was made for Satan, spirits. They can endure probably the torment of the hell, but not you. Not you and I. And again, you will miss it in Jesus' name. Then comes the resurrection. There is a resurrection that's going to take place. Now, resurrection, there are two forms of resurrection, two types of forms of resurrection. I hope you know that already by this time right now. There is the resurrection of the righteous or the just and the resurrection of uh, the evil ones, separated by this period of time, especially the millennial 1,000-year period. Jesus Christ is the first one that enjoyed that resurrection. Let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 to 23. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. How many people were made alive? All. So it does not matter who, wicked or good person, there is a resurrection coming. Your dying is not the end. There is something coming. That's why we are careful how we live on this, during this time, it's a qualifying period for what awaits us in eternity. Don't joke. Don't joke with your period of time here. And because you don't know when the, that period of time you have here is going to end with death. That's why we don't postpone salvation. Okay? As in Adam all die, just like all will die, as you are sure of death, in Christ be sure of one thing. Resurrection is coming. Okay, verse 23, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterwards, who, those, those, you and me, who are Christ at his coming. So res the, the resurrection of the just will be made up of in different phases. Christ first, and then those at his coming. During the rapture, we will go. And there will also be another resurrection after the great tribulation, or after the great when during the second coming, because those who will be martyred, killed by the Antichrist in his rage against God, but those who know and now know the truth, didn't want to believe and accept Jesus Christ now, and had to go through the tribulation period, probably will have to be martyred. They will have to pay, since they rejected the blood of the Lamb shed for them, they will now have to pay with their own lives. And at the end, God probably will, will, will raise them up also. So those righteous dead that died for Christ and his word will form the first set of resur resurrection or called resurrection of the just. Daniel chapter 12, verse number 2 to 4. Daniel himself will be seen. I will meet Daniel that day. According to Daniel 12, 2 to 4. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting content. That is the part I'm saying you will not belong to in Jesus' name. Verse 3, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Those who are wise, who are they? And those who turn many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever and forever. The Bible said in Proverbs, those who win souls are wise. They are the ones who shine during that resurrection of the just. Verse 4, I like that verse 4, a personal promise to Daniel. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. When is resurrection taking place? The time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. So this resurrection we're talking about will come at the time of the end. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 28, 29. Jesus Christ is speaking. Do not marvel at this, Jesus said. Don't marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. 
those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of the condemnation. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 to 6, talks about the same thing. So there are two forms of resurrection. One is for those who have who identify and have accepted Christ, and I want you to be included in that. Okay, but that will come, their resurrection will be during the rapture, and that is all I want to say. I don't want you to belong to anyone, any other group of this thing. So get ready now, so that we are all going to make it during the rapture. If not, then the, those, the second resurrection, which is the resurrection of the, con, of, the, of, the, of the evil dead, that is going to take place after the millennium. Can you imagine you miss the rapture? Yes, you will miss the, the great tribulation, but you will also miss the great 1,000-year period of the millennial peaceful reign. It is at the end of that, when the Satan is about to be thrown into the hell, that they will now raise you up. Okay? And then together, together with Satan, you're going to be thrown Everyone that rises, raised up at that time, will be thrown into the bottomless pit. Let me go to judgment, and if possible, uh, round up on that. Judgment, that like resurrection, also is two forms of uh, judgment. The word judgment frightens a Christian, and it should for good reason. But I want you to know that if you are a born again Christian, your sins, my sins, when I accepted Christ, have, have been judged on the cross of Calvary. Remember, the sins were poured, my sins. When the moment you say yes to Jesus, as I want you to do today, in, at that moment, your sins have been poured. That's what shielded the Son when Jesus Christ was on the cross. Cut off the Son. And God took, the Father took his eyes away from his Son because our sins were poured on him. That is what I want. To happen in your life today. That's the purpose of all these teachings. Okay? Now, when that happens, when you accept Christ, your sins have been judged on the cross. You will never be judged again. You have passed from judgment into life. Okay? Every born again child of God will not be judged again. Not during the rapture, not after the rapture. We are celebrating in the feast of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the marriage supper. Okay? And the, remember, Jesus Christ, the bride is the bride. So everybody that is qualified to be part of the church is going to be raptured during that time. No someone left behind. Just accept him and live sincerely, okay, the best way you can. And you will not be left out. Now, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, let me read that scripture in Romans 14, 10. Because these are some of the scriptures that frightens Christians. I don't want you to be frightened. The rapture and meeting Christ is a joyous hope. We eagerly wait for it. We're not supposed to be afraid. If you are born again, sincerely you have given your life from your heart to Christ. You shouldn't be afraid. By the grace of God, God is going to qualify you. That's what he said. He said, pray that you may be found worthy. No one by himself or herself, it does not matter what reverend or how holy you are, excluding the speaker, none of us will make it if God, God marks iniquity. But because it is a journey of grace, we started by grace, and by grace we are going to round it up. And that is why I know you will make it. Provided at the end, if you have not, at the end, in a moment as I round up, you are going to join me in making that prayer and committing your life to Christ. We are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, but there are two types of judgment. One is called the judgment seat of Christ. It is called the Bema, B-E-M-A, Bema judgment. Okay? The word Bema is just a word in those days that they used to refer to the official seat, like the one I'm sitting on, that the one, that the referee or the judge or the official sits during a game, okay, during a tournament, let, the only best thing I can give you is to give you a picture of today's um, tennis. Let's say um, the Wimbledon that they played or in any of these things. You notice that the referee is seated in one exalted seat high so that he can see everything that is going on. Now, in those days, that seat is where the official seat, especially those who are to 
um, pass out and give out the, the, the prizes. That exalted seat from which they sit also to make speeches and then eventually the, the, the com competitors and the participants will come and gather and prizes will be given to it. That seat is called Bima. That is the seat born again Christians will appear. That is what is referred to when we say we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Ev listen to this. Listen to this. Everyone who appears before the judgment seat of Christ has already made heaven. Nobody is going to be turned away to hell. If we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you have already made heaven. If you stand before the second judgment seat, which is called in the book of Revelation, I'm coming to it in a moment, which is called the white throne judgment. Everyone that will be raised to stand there will all of them, that is just a sentencing face, they will all be thrown into the pit, the bottomless pit. Think, of, think about it. When does a person seal his eternity in life? Is it not when you leave earth at the point of death? So when you're already dead and when you're already with God and you stand before the judgment seat, then from there he's going to throw you out again back to it. No, your destiny is already sealed at the time of death. So I want to encourage you, Christians. We have not taught this as pastors very well clearly. I want you to know that when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it is to receive different and varying degrees of prizes. That is exactly what Paul had in mind when he was talking in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 to 15. Remember, he said, we are co-laborers with God. But depending on the motive and the attitude with which you walk, two areas, the motive and the attitude with which you do your work in this world, we are going to be given, well, our work will be likened to us building with uh, gold, silver, or wood, or straw. So some of us are going to lose the reward because the motive, you are saying everything right, but why, what is motivating you to do what you are doing and the attitude with which you approach it? Some people are doing a good work, but their attitude is just all bad murmuring and all kind of things like this. These are the things that Paul said nobody should judge a brother or make him angry because we all are going to anyway stand before the judgment seat and only he who sees everything that man cannot see, he will be the one to say, have the final say. That was what he was referring to. So whether it's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 or Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, judgment seat of Christ refers to reward time, okay? And then the great white throne judgment, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 to 15. That will be a sentencing of all that are evil. It just them rising up. The Bible said death will give up his own captives. The sea and Hades, hell will give up his own death. And then they will all be sentenced and they will all get back permanently and forever eternity will spend their time in the lake of fire. Then after that is done, the whole creation at that time is passed away, completely wiped clean, a new beginning. Behold, I make all things new, Revelation 21.5. Lastly, there's a scripture I want us to read. I know our time is gone, but this is the last session. Let's read this scripture to round it up. It is the beautiful story that you already know, the parable of the good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. A certain lawyer, an expert of law, trying to test Jesus Christ, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus Christ said to him, do what is said in the law. How do you read? And the man quoted, Jesus Christ said, that's all right, you quoted right. Now do that and you shall live. Remember, that was still the Old Testament. And the man, the Bible said, trying to prove himself right, justify himself, asked Jesus Christ this question. But who is my neighbor? <laughs> man, it, the wisdom of the master, Jesus. I cannot stop just worshiping Jesus anytime I read this parable. Who is my neighbor? A human being was trying to ask his own master, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ 
in telling him who his neighbor was in Luke chapter 10, from verse 30 down, began to tell him this story. And in telling this story, Jesus Christ was retelling the creation of man and how he fell and the whole journey of how he, the good Samaritan, had come to love and reproduce and re pick up this man that has fallen among thieves and rescue him back to his original portion. Everything I have been preaching about, I have just told you, is encapsulated in this brief, brief parable. Let me read it one more time before we pray. You ready? But from verse 30, Luke 10. Then Jesus answered, to the question of this man, who is my neighbor, Jesus Christ said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. About 10 miles journey, I have been there on that road. Most of you must have an opportunity to visit Jerusalem. It's a very rocky mountain road from Jerusalem to Jericho, the place of peace, Jerusalem, God's headquarter to Jericho, a cursed city. He is talking about the journey of man glorified with glory in Eden, in Eden coming, becoming cursed. And when you go from God's presence into a place of curse, what happens? The thief is about to will, is, is, is bound to waylay you. So he fell up, and that place in Jerusalem, I mean in, in Israel, in, in, the, in that, that land called Palestine, is known that is because it's rocky and winding thieves hide in so many places to attack people. In the days of Jesus Christ, it was known for that. So this man traveling, he had no business traveling from the presence of God into a cursed city. Okay? Jericho, you must understand, is the lowest spot on the surface of the earth, even as I speak today. That's why the water, the sea, the Dead Sea beside Jericho, just six miles away from Jericho, if you jump into it, instead of sinking, you float. So Jericho is the lowest place on earth. Man fell from his high place of Jerusalem in the presence of God in the Garden of Eden into the lowest place that you can get. And then in the process, he fell among thieves. Satan is a thief, remember? And then he stripped him, beat him, stripped him of his clothing and wounding him. Every man that is listening to me that has not accepted Christ, you fell among, this is not how God wanted you to live. You are half dead and you don't even know it. All that is good in you has been stripped from you. Your clothing and you are wounded in your spirit. That's why you keep on going to alcohol, lying, women, all these sins. Just try to leave it, leave it up. You are, you are aiming for what you are given, but you lost. That's why you go to all of this extent to do all of these things. So they wounded him, left him half dead, dead departed leaving him half dead. Verse 31, by chance, say that with me, by chance. By chance, what happened? A certain priest came down that road and saw him and he passed by cleanly on the other side. The priest and then, of course, the Levite also came. A Levite and a priest, these were the authority people that were authorized in the Old Testament to be able to read the law and make sacrifices for sin when people have heard. The law originally, I tell people, God did not make the law for you. For, God did not make the law so that we can obey it. The truth is none of us can obey the, the law, the demands of the law. The law, according to the Bible, were only a schoolmaster leading us, bringing us to the ultimate, the good Samaritan, the good neighbor, Jesus Christ himself. So finding Jesus Christ, accepting him is the ultimate, not in Ten Commandments. Nobody can make heaven by just obeying the Ten Commandments. If that were possible, well, why would God bring Jesus Christ again after giving Ten Commandments? Because righteousness cannot be found in any other except in one name alone, Jesus Christ. That was what brought it. That was why the priest, by chance, by chance, it was not meant to be, it was not in God's original plan. It was because of the increase of sin that God brought the law to guard and to, you know, direct people to Christ. The priest couldn't do it, he passed by on the other side. The Levite couldn't do it, passed by the other Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. Why did he describe himself as a Samaritan? Because earlier on in John chapter 8, verse 48, 
the same Jews have called and insulted Jesus Christ, calling him Samaritan. He said, well, I may be a Samaritan, but I'm a good Samaritan, he said. But the good Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. He came to where you and I who had been beaten, left half dead, stripped naked. When he saw him, he had compassion. Oh, the compassion of the good Samaritan. No law can give you that. The compassion of the good Samaritan is what drew him to us. And that is the reason why those who love Christ love him because of his compassion. Oh, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your compassion. None of us will even have a mouth to be talking. Not a preacher, not a Christian will dare to even say one word without your compassion. Thank you for your compassion that faileth not. New every morning. Blessed be your name. Thank you. Thank you. His compassion drew him. He saw this. Now remember, the, the, the man left half dead did not call him. The good Samaritan saw him and came. Compassion drew him to the, to the place of need. And he went to him. Take a look at the steps the good Samaritan took. He went to him, number one. Number two, bandaged his wounds. Number three, pouring oil and wine. Oil for healing, wine for reinvigoration, sustenance, bubbling in the spirit. And he, I like this one. I, he set him on his own animal, on his own beast. The old King James will say, grace. Grace is, has brought us thus far. The animal that carried us from our place of sin and will eventually take us home to the inn where he is taking the man who fell among sin is grace. That's why we're riding on. And that's why I said, when the good Samaritan is leading that animal called grace, and you are on top of it, you don't fear any fall. Be confident about one thing. We are going to make it. That is what keeps us going on. Yes, we may stagger, we may make mistakes here and there, but don't you listen to anybody. You have made the best choice by accepting Christ. Stay with it. He is going to make us worthy when the trumpet sounds. Hallelujah. So he led him, put him on the end, and brought him to an inn. What is the inn today? The church. Okay? And he took care, to took care of him. The next day, 35. On the next day, when, they, when he departed, who is the one that has departed? Jesus Christ. He took out two denarii. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 and 2 told us that a denarii is... A laborer's wage for a day. A day. And Peter told us a day unto the Lord is like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. So when he brought out two denarii, he was bringing out a payment for two years. Or two days or two years, prophetic years, if you like. Then he gave him the two, uh, two, two uh, dinner right to the innkeeper, and he said to him, take care of him. Ah, oh, God, I know my time is gone, but I, I, I love this so much. Take care of him. Say that again. Take care of me. The Holy Spirit's job is to take care of you. See, he is not looking out for your mistakes or my mistakes. His job is to take care of us. I don't take that as liberty to now become careless or wayward. But I know that in my mistakes and in my blunder, there is someone looking out for me under the instruction of the master. Take care of him. You are being taken care of by the Holy Spirit. And God will take care of you. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, maritally, in every area. Believe it and it comes to pass in your life. The Holy Spirit's job is to take care of you. Take care of him. And whatever you, more you spend, when I come again, can I ask you a question? Who is coming again? Who promised coming back again? Jesus. That's what I'm talking about in the rapture. When I come again, I will repay you. Now, Jesus Christ has already paid for two years' worth. And since he left from the Mount of Olives, this is 2,000 and 
20 years. Two dinner has been paid. We are just living on extra time. I said all of this to just point this very far. You and I are just living on extra time. And that's why I keep saying this over and over. It could be this moment. It could be this night. It could be tomorrow. There is no more time left to ponder over. You've had this enough. It is time to make up your mind. It's time to make up your mind. The most important reason for existence is to make up your mind. The greatest decision you will make is to accept Christ. Receive him into your life. You don't need to go to church where you are right now, even without closing eyes if you like. But from the depth of your heart, for with the heart man believeth unto salvation and with the mouth confession is made. I want you right now to pray with me this prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the hour has come. All of this we have been teaching so far is down to this one point. You gave and sent the good Samaritan to come and rescue a stubborn man that left his place of abode and fell into the hands of the thief. And yet you will leave your glorious throne and come to rescue us. Paid for our salvation. Lord, give grace to everyone hearing me that will listen still to come back home. Come back home. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Arrest every heart right now. Everyone that shall hear. Pull them into the cross. Bring them into the inn. Save our lives, O oh God. And as many as confess you right now and open up their hearts, Lord, pull them, take them, bring them, make them ready. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for spending all this time with us. That brings, that about wraps up all that we've been talking about this end time series. This is it, folks. The bottom line, the reason why we do all of this is so that you will, together with me and the rest of the church, be able one day to stand before Christ and say, it is not by anything, just by your grace. Father, we thank you once again for seeing us through this series and your understanding. Now it's in your hand, O oh God. Use these faltering lips of Pastor James. Holy Spirit, and draw as many. Use it to draw as many that you can bring into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you are going to if you are listening and have access to television, I will still be preaching Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, 12.30 on OGTV. DSTV, Go TV. Any of this will give you access to OGTV if you are listening every Sunday afternoon, 12.30. Join me on TV as we listen to it. Now, it's time to give an offering. I want you to give in partnership for the work we do. I want you to give your tithe and offering. I want you to give in support of helps. Whatever you want to give the system that you are well aware of, we can follow through it. Now let's share the grace together. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. And you say to me, may you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. 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 God bless you. Bye bye. We we'll meet next Sunday again. I'll be starting a teaching on another series. Okay. God bless you.